Hello, I'm a Pommy. This is a podcast. Welcome to the Pommy podcast. Today we have a special guest, Chris Gray, also known as the Lambo guy. Do you still have the Lambo, mate? Nah, all gone. All gone? Got a different selection these days. <laughs> How many have we got now? Uh, up to 15. Not all working, some still being built, but okay. uh, yeah, probably 10 working, 15, 15 all up. Nice. Uh, I think we'll touch base on that in a bit. Let's let's go back a little while. Little younger Chris back yeah. in the day, back in the UK. Uh, what was your upbringing like? Um, you know, how did how did you get up to you know university, family life, all that type of thing? Yeah. Um, so I lived in a place called Radlett near St Albans in the UK. Mm -hmm. So kind of one o'clock on the M25. Mm -hmm. um, Dad was a heart uh, physician. Uh, Mum was a nurse or used to be a nurse. Um, so good family background, like nice house and and but just went to a reasonable school, so we didn't go to private school. My parents weren't really into flash and and, yeah. and the money side of things. Um, but like a good background and just learnt the the things about honesty and right and wrong and all that kind of stuff. But I basically hated school, but I was I did the minimum just to get by. I think I did the same. I think I basically did. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna need, do I need these GCSEs? My mum was like, oh, you know, whatever, as long as you do okay and you're happy, that's absolutely fine. So I just kind of, I think I got averaged averaged out a C. Yeah, and I was so pretty I was pretty much it, that. just a basic pass, yeah, that's yeah, all yeah. I needed. Yeah. Um, but I was, I was actually really lazy at school, so when, when you hear the rest of the story, people say, oh, you're an overachiever, and I said, no, I'm actually lazy. But I actually just worked hard in my 20s so that I didn't have to work for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. So kind of work hard to be lazy in a way. So after school, you obviously got got your C's. That obviously yeah, gave you loads so of got that. Then took a year off and did. Um, I was a car courier in London for six months. I used to whereabouts in London? Um, all around. So I used to pick up the fashion labels from Luton, okay. and then deliver to them all to the fashion houses in the West End. <laughs> so I was this spotty little kid, like a little eighteen-year-old. Yeah. But there's all these kind of hot chicks in London that um, I'd have a hangover looking rough as day. <laughs> day, but you'd be in the West End of London delivering all the labels for the fashion uh, oh, fashion mate. manufacturers. How long did you do that for? Uh, so I did that for about six months, and my business skills was I started off. I think three thousand pounds in debt buying a car, and I ended up five thousand pounds in debt. So I wasn't a great businessman, but I loved <laughs> I loved driving, even in London traffic. Then came to Australia for for three or four months, yeah. and then uh, absolutely loved it and vowed to come back. I had no money for travelling, so the furthest I went in Australia was the Blue Mountains on a day trip the weekend <laughs> before I flew back. And I basically never taken a flight, so I did a round the world trip, and the furthest I got was the Blue Mountains. Fuck. I literally um, I remember the first time I arrived here. Um, so I literally just left the Marines, got a one-way ticket to Sydney, and then I was in Sydney doing landscaping, actually around here. Yeah. All the wealthy people needed a landscaper. I fucking hated that job. Yeah. I was doing it just like 30 bucks an hour. I was like, I'll just do it. My mate introduced me to some bloke who paid me cash at the end of the week. I was like, I'll do this for a little bit. And then six weeks later, I landed a job in Dubai because I okay. stopped, stopped in Dubai halfway for two weeks. Yeah. Met this bloke who needed a personal trainer at the time and then got the job offer. So I flew all the way out here seven weeks landscaped in a job that I fucking hated didn't go outside of Sydney and, yeah. and then moved back to Dubai so it's just yeah it's but sometimes stuff similar. like that then it gives you the will to then go and do it so I vowed yeah. if I ever came back yeah. I'd do every bungee jump every white water rafting and that's yeah. in the fact what I did yeah did um, you do the one in Queenstown the bungee jump no um, South Africa Victoria oh, Falls South, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Seen that one. so when I came back for the second time then I had um, I basically had a Porsche and I sold that for I think ten thousand yeah. pounds, and that was then my travelling money for uh, for a year, and so I went through half of Africa like for a couple of months, and then flew up to Hong Kong, and then almost by land from Hong Kong to Australia, but I did literally every single kind of thing that you could do because before yeah. I just didn't have the money for it. Yeah, yeah. So how how did we acquire the Porsche? Because you went from having no money then. Yeah. To then so then I went back to the back. UK. Um, mum gave me a midnight curfew and I said, Mum, I'm an international traveller now. I'll come back from Australia. I <laughs> should be adult. able to come back from the, the, the local pub. But it was my house, my rules. And so, um, but that was the amazing catalyst. So we'd inherited, I think, £10,000. Mm. And mm -hmm. I earned £10,000 a year. So normally you could borrow three times your income, so thirty grand. Um, but I looked at thirty grand will get you a really crappy studio unit in the worst part of town. Yeah. So I then looked at three bedroom houses in the best part of town, which were then say eighty to a hundred thousand pounds. But what I worked out was, if I could rent two rooms out, I could actually live for free. Yeah. And so I basically pitched it to my dad, saying, by myself, I can only afford this studio, which is not a great investment either. 
Um, but if I can get a guarantee from you for the bank, so I'm not after any money, I just want, just the guarantee. want a guarantee. Yeah. And so I ended up buying a hundred grand place for 80,000 because I was a first home buyer and over there you're not in a chain so you can mm -hmm. negotiate harder. So I basically made two years salary overnight and I lived in a three bedroom house in the best part of town for free. And then that grew for a couple of years and then I learned about um, redrawing equity. So I saw an advert in the paper saying you can use your equity, which no one had even heard of, for a home renovation or a car. So I said, oh, can I borrow 5,000 pounds for a car? And they said, no, the minimum's 15 and you've got to prove that you're buying the car. Yeah. So I went down to the local Porsche dealership. I couldn't afford a Porsche on a three year lease, but yeah. on a 25 year mortgage, I could. Yeah, you could, yeah. yeah so yeah. I said, oh, you've got a car for 15,000 pounds and I was gonna have a, like a black one that kind of blended in and ended up with a red convertible. <laughs> Stuck out looking <laughs> so absolutely loved it. Yeah. Turned up on parents' house and he's like, how do you afford that? Oh, fuck, and yeah. Dad, you don't want to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I um I I did the same things when I landed in Dubai I didn't I didn't buy the house in Dubai because you couldn't get a mortgage as a resident there yeah um and the mortgages were like five years if you could get a mortgage anyway because the banking system wasn't up to date yet but um I ended up renting this massive villa um out in this like lovely suburb yeah garden um and then I knew that the rental market for mm. for for a standard room was like something like a thousand pounds a month or okay. two thousand eighteen hundred dollars in in Australian yeah. So the whole place was like the equivalent of three rooms being rented out. So yeah. I was like, well, I'll just rent this and then I'll rent it out to each. To okay. each. So I, I ended up only paying the bills. Yeah. So I literally paid like the electricity yeah. and stuff like that and didn't pay. And it's a, a bit of sacrifice, penny. but it's it's worth it. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, yeah. there was a bit of hassle every now and then when you get someone that you don't like that moves in and stuff yeah. like that. But I said this, I was actually talking to my little brother about this the other day because he's 20 and he wants to get in the property market. He's back in London. And I said to him, you, you need to buy somewhere and rent the room out. Someone yeah. else is paying the mortgage or at least you're not expensing so you can carry on saving. So... It's funny that you go down that strategy as well, but I actually, yeah, I ended up, I ended up being, buying like a big five point seven liter V eight pickup truck. Okay. And I was yeah. like twenty three years old. I was like, fuck it, like I've yeah. got the money for it now because I'm not expensing anything apart from some bills. Yeah. So I just went and got the car and thought, fuck it, I'm gonna. Have because it. a lot of people would say, oh, using <clears throat> um, equity for bad and it's bad debt. It's bad debt, yeah. But the reality was, is say the house had gone from eighty thousand to one twenty. Mm. If I'd sold it, paid all the taxes bought the car, everyone would say that's okay. But then you've got no asset rising. Got no, no. So pulling the equity out, it's effectively, <clears throat> it's cheaper than selling it, paying the stamp duty to get back in. And why not reward yourself? So mm. as long as you're only taking small amounts out, yeah. then I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, with those rewards. Yeah, I remember I moved, I moved back to the UK. I bought my first house uh, when I was still in the Marines. They had a scheme where they basically would give you, if you had like eight grand saved mm. up, they would let you borrow the same amount as long as you paid it before you left. Okay. At zero yeah. zero percent interest. So yeah. I was like, well, this is great. I'm just going to buy a house. So I ended up buying a house up north. And actually, that house, I did the numbers because I've put it up for sale last week. Uh, I've had it for ten years, but mm. I did the numbers last. Uh, yeah, I did the numbers last week, and then and then uh, engaged a real estate agent to sell it. But I bought the house for eight grand. It's made me one hundred and twenty grand. So I pulled out equity twice. Yeah. I calculated the amount of rent that I'd made on the property. I mm. paid five mortgage payments myself in ten years. Yeah. Um, got chased once by the local council because I forgot that you have to pay council tax when you uh, when you don't have a tenant in place. So they 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 tripled. I think I I think I got a fine twice or two or three months. I got a fine, so I ended up having to pay them like five hundred quid instead of hundred. But it's all whatever. peanuts in the grand scheme yeah, of things, it, and you're never going to save that amount of money from uh, from whatever your job is. So no. it's um no. yeah, in hindsight, it's easy money. So, after you got the red Porsche, yep. Then I bought a second property. So yep. I did a joint venture with my dad that we both basically put money in. He put in more than me, and then obviously got the mortgage. And so we paid ourselves say six percent interest on our capital that we put in, mm -hmm. and then we'd split the profits fifty fifty. Yeah. And the whole idea about that is is even if you can't afford to do something yourself, you can do joint ventures. So I did one with my dad. Later on, I did one with a stranger in the UK mm. when I was living here to buy one in uh, in Queensland. And so it just teaches you the met methodology that if you know you can make profits, rather than just buy one, keep repeating it like the McDonald's thing. Yep. And if you haven't got the deposit or if you haven't got the serviceability for a mortgage, find someone else that has. Find someone else that has. So yeah, again, is, if you're them. really good at saving, you need to find a friend that's maybe a doctor, lawyer, accountant that's got a high income, but they go and spend all their money 
but they can get the mortgage, you can put the deposit in, you can do all the work, yeah. and then you can split the profit maybe 50-50. Yeah, it's funny because the first home buyer scheme in Australia has recently changed on July 1, and now you're allowed friends to join in. So recent, before it had to be like a spouse yeah. or like a like a mum or dad, parent, whatever, whereas now you can have friends mm. do it. So you, you don't have yeah. to be de facto, whatever. So you and your mate, first time buyers, can go and buy a six hundred grand apart one bed apartment somewhere. Yeah. Do whatever you want with it. Um, and realistically, you're putting down fifteen thousand dollars each. Yeah. So it do, it does make me laugh. I was going to talk to you about procrastination, right? Is I find that there's a lot of people that um and are a bit too much when it comes to property because they think that it's too easy. Yeah. So they have this thing in their head. They're like, well, if it, surely everyone would be doing it if yeah. it's that easy. Well, it's all you've and actually got to put. Thing. You've actually got to yeah. put your money where your mouth is, right? And and put the money. And I had that at Deloitte. So um, by the time I was at Deloitte in early two thousand, I was earning six hundred grand a year from property. So I had six properties growing at hundred grand a year in the boom yeah. in uh, early two thousands. I was earning eighty grand or sixty after tax. Yep. Yeah. And so I was turning up to to Deloitte. So I was a junior accountant. No one knew my name, and I had a convertible three five five Ferrari. <laughs> bright red again. I fucking love that. Um, That's my favourite car. It's it, absolutely what amazing it? car. Uh, bright red. Yeah, bright red. Yeah. Um, nice. And and they asked me to explain the strategy, which I started teaching people. And they said, no, if it was that easy, everyone would do it. And I'm saying, no. The problem is, is you're too clever. Yeah. You're always trying to find the latest, greatest thing. I agree. You're dealing with billion dollar businesses and takeovers, and you think you've got to find something that no one else can, like um, the arbitrage or something. You don't need to. You just need to be in the market. Yeah. And we see that say that all the time now. Like my book that I put out back in I think two thousand and eight. We haven't changed a word in fifteen years, but it's simple, straightforward. We've had GFCs. We've had COVID. We've had credit crunches, banking commissions, interest rates are paid over ten percent. We've gone down to two or three, but the fundamentals are still the same. And when yeah. you buy the family home or that similar kind of thing in a good suburb, it goes up in time. It doesn't go up every year. It goes through ups and downs. But you just need to hold on. Hold on, yeah. Almost anything you bought 10 or 20 years ago, you'd have made money, obviously, if it wasn't in a mining town or something weird like that. So yeah. normal property does go up. So let's let's touch on rent vesting at that point because I'm a firm believer in it. Um, I just think, like, just literally from the scenario of moving to Dubai, renting out each of the rooms, having zero expenses. Obviously, now I've got a family and stuff like that. But I recently moved... Um, I live in Artarman, Lower North Shore. That house recently got sold for 3.2 million. I was paying 12.50 a week. I've moved two streets down the road to a $4 million property that could only rent for 1,100 a week. Yeah. Um, which I just found out last week as well, because we moved on the weekend. But this place, I mean, we've got yeah. Harbour Bridge. We'll show the views later we'll on. We'll show the views. <laughs> <laughs> Harbour Bridge, Opera yeah. House, you know, the, you've got so, the docks so basically there. we're in Darling Point, so everyone gets a whole floor, completely round building, so there's views from every single room. Uh, we're 10 stories up, so it's roughly kind of helicopter level that you can see the bridge and, yeah. and everything else around town. Um, the apartments are roughly worth maybe six to eight million dollars. I think the rent here is 16.50 um, yeah. a week, so it's maybe 80 grand a year. Whereas if you had say seven million at say 6%, then that's 400 grand in interest. Yep. Um, the strata fees in here can be horrific, 25 to 50, maybe even 100 grand, like a, on a bad special levy and stuff. Whereas the whole idea is if I bought seven $1 million apartments and they rented out even at 3.5%, so 700 a week, I'd be getting five grand a week in, I'd still have $7 million worth of property, but then I'm only paying 1650 out. So I'm making like 3,300 a week. Mm. So 150 to 200 grand I'm saving, You're doubling plus that. my seven million <coughs> debts deductible. Yeah. And so, and if I can't afford it or I freak out, then I can give them a couple of weeks notice and, and move out. Well, it's like if you, if you were gonna put a deposit on this, you've got to put down 20%, you've got your stamp duty fees, which are extortionate. You know, if, if you can't afford a 20% deposit, you've yeah. got to pay lenders mortgage insurance on top and stuff so like that. So it'd be basically a couple of million dollars down a million and dollars, having yeah. a, a five or six million dollar mortgage. And you're spending pff, oh, ridiculous amounts. Like, wh why? why would yeah. you, like, to me, like, uh, obviously if you, if you a lot, a lot of the people, especially oh, in this building, I reckon they're about to pop their clogs, aren't they? Half the yeah, yeah. Right? But that's the advantage <coughs> for me is they're not going to rent their garage spaces because <laughs> they're too old to keep drive. The car, keep the cars yeah. in there. But, um, it it just it, it's one of those things like I feel like if you if you bought these properties 
15, 20 years ago and you managed to get them for a million bucks or whatever it was and you had the money at the time, then great. But now But I still wouldn't do it because the equivalent is I'd be buying course, 200 yeah. grand units instead. Yeah, of course. And, and so here the, the capital growth is very, very lumpy. Mm. Whereas when you're buying median price properties, which is what I do in blue chip suburbs, then it's generally a lot more consistent because there's always buyers and sellers. Yeah. Whereas for these kind of things, if you want to get a certain price, it could take you six or 12 months to go and sell. That's the difference in the, yeah, I think like in the rental market is if you go above that thousand dollars a week, yeah. there's less people at the open home. Right? Yeah. So if I turn up to a house in Lower North Shore, you turn up to a, a fancy apartment, you know, looking over the Harbour Bridge, you know, that you're probably going to get two or three couples there. Yeah. Whereas you turn up to the affordable, um, yeah, so Bondi Beach, Bondi two Beach, bedroom, whatever, and, two yeah. bed, eight, seven hundred, eight hundred a week, eight fifty, whatever it is. Um, you're going to get 20, 30 people turning up. There's more yeah. competition, but they're the perfect places to buy. Yeah, um, or to invest in. Yeah. To invest in, yeah, per but perfect to invest in. Um, so, talk to me about your portfolio. How did it? How did it all begin in in Australia? What were you doing job wise at the time? So yeah, to obviously get into it and afford it and stuff like that. And then how did it grow from there? Sure. So when I moved here at 27, so in 1997, I then looked at using the equity. So I didn't sell my two UK properties. So while mm -hmm. I did my international travel to, to get over here, I basically spent, um, I went through half of Africa and then from Hong Kong, almost by land all the way to Australia, mm -hmm. doing all the Bundy jumps and all the things I couldn't afford to do before, yeah. using some of the Porsche money. <laughs> and then I came to Australia and the whole thing was is, my parents had always said rent money's dead money. Yep. So I then went to buy a two bedroom in Coogee, uh, north facing, overlooking Wedding Cake Island, a uh, small block of nine, um, literally 500 metres from the beach. And I basically paid 360 at auction. And all, all the local Aussies were saying, you Poms have got no idea, you come over with your pounds, you think you know everything. Um, don't you know it's going to crash at the, at the Olympics? Because it always does. Yeah. Um, that apartment now is worth probably about $2 million or something like that. So again, it's, it seemed ridiculous, 360,000. And that's the thing is property is always expensive. And then from there, then that was, uh, that was rising. So I then used the equity from that to then buy another one in Tamarama. And that was a two bedder that was on stilts. Um, had a bit of a garden shed behind that um, the previous owners had bought the airspace. And I converted that from a two bed, two bath into three bed, three bath. Uh, no parking, which is the only thing that I wouldn't do these days. But again, three bed, three bath for three females in Sydney that all want their own bathroom. Yeah. They're all professionals, all go leaving home at the same time. Yep. Even though that's had mould and damp at times, it's always been rented. And then I bought number five and then I bought number six. So at the age of, um, I think I was 31, I was at Deloitte's earning that money and basically making 600 grand a year. And I just couldn't, I couldn't spend that kind of money. Yeah. So I rented out uh, the Tamarama one, and that's when I learned about rent vesting. We bought, um, or we rented this place in Coogee, townhouse right on the water, overlooking Gordon's Bay. So you could jump, jump off the back wall and scuba dive in the back garden, effectively. <laughs> and I think we were paying something like six hundred and fifty bucks for a one and a half to two million dollar two level townhouse right on the water. Right on the water. Like yeah. you couldn't get any closer. Yeah. And so my flatmate, I think he only paid two fifty. I think I paid three seventy or something. So I paid the high one for the bigger room. Mm. Um, and I've never never lived in my own home since, and I don't think I'll ever live in my own home. So you're like, it's interesting you say that because I, and it, and it's funny that you, you the uh, analogy where the Aussies are taking the piss out of the pommies for buying on the waterfront and stuff like that. But I feel like <clears throat> if you've come from around London or any major city, you know, I feel like Sydney's 15 years behind in mm. that sense. So Sydney's land land size is basically the same size as London with half the population. Yeah. But we all know where London went. Yeah. And everyone was like, London, the, the you know, those those apartments can't go above five hundred grand, surely. Yeah. And now they're worth one million, one point five million, two million, like ridic yeah. ridiculous prices. And that's exactly what's gonna happen here. Is I think they did the stats that hundred thousand hundred thousand people are coming to Sydney every single year now. Mm. They've only they're only building sixty odd thousand houses a year. Yeah. You do the math, that's thirty thousand people that haven't got a home, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> there's a lot of um I remember like obviously back in the UK when there was this big thing about obviously rent vesting, but also these HMO properties, like you say, three girls want to live in one, one yeah. apartment, they all need a bathroom each. Do you feel like Sydney is going to go down that route where we're going to end up having the sort of like co-living spaces essentially 
like they yeah. do in London all the time. Look, I'm not sure because I haven't really been back to London in, in that kind of um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 20 or 30 years or so, apart from quick visits. But the main thing is that I thought if you look around stuff like the eastern beaches, <coughs> Lionel Shore in the west, mm. there's no more land. No, there isn't. Though. There's three-storey height limits, so you can't build these big buildings anymore. Uh, you can't bribe the councils like you could in the, in the old days, apparently. <laughs> Um, so they can't physically build any more properties. And if yeah. they knock down a block of 12, they can probably only put nine there again. Yeah. So you're not increasing the mass. So certainly when you get lots of people coming into Australia, especially the wealthy ones, the whole idea is people say wages aren't keeping up with inflation or house price inflation, so how can property prices keep getting higher? But if you've got rich people coming in, or you've got people, say, say for us and our kids, we're going to be giving our kids deposits. Like yeah. without doubt, there's the only way. So we've made our money and our parents have made our money from property. The only way property prices will continue is passing the, the intergenerational wealth down. Yeah. And when there's no more properties in Bondi or Manly or Balmain, mm. that will push prices up. And sure, the average person will have to move further and further out west or north or south. And, and this isn't the debate whether it's right or wrong from a social or political thing. It's more the fact is, this is Bondi gonna is going to increase. Yeah. And sure, it's it's... One and a half, two mil for a two bedroom unit there now, at some point it will be three, four or five yeah. and people will be able to afford it. Yeah. So the whole thing is, is as an investor, I'm not going to debate all those other things. I'm just saying, well, if it's going to rise, that's where I want to invest. Yeah, I think complaining about it doesn't help you. Like no. It just stalls you from making the actual decision. Like the amount of times I'll have someone, they'll say, you know, when do you think the property prices are coming down? I'm like, not for the areas that you want to live in. They're yeah. not. They're just not because... If you look at anywhere west of the uh, east of the bridge, mm. or even what will be in ten years' time, anything east of Parramatta, yeah, it will be the same story. And yeah. it will be like people saying, you know, when do you think the property price is going? Well, it's not going to go down yeah. because the population keeps going up. And it's and like the three sixty I paid in Coogee <laughs> is now in hindsight, even if you paid five hundred or six hundred, even if you paid double the price, yeah, it's still worth it. Yeah, of course. And so. But everyone said at the time, 360 was expensive. But my parents bought a place in uh, in the UK, I think, um, literally 50 years ago, 49 years ago, for 30 or 40 thousand pounds. Everyone said to my parents, "You're mad. You're overcapitalized. It's got subsidence. It's going to be at the bottom of the hill in 50 years." <laughs> and they finally replaced the roof that they were told 50 years ago that they're going to have to replace. Yeah. But now the property is worth millions. And that's the thing is property has always been expensive. So if you're waiting for it to be cheap, it, it's never going to happen. Yeah, I feel like that. And, and also like the, for a lot of people that I talk to in, in Sydney, if, you, if you're moving, if you're moving here, you, why are you moving here? Yeah. You're moving here because you want to be... Because we're in the middle of winter. It's a blue sky. It's a gorgeous day. It's a lovely day. And, um, <laughs> and you don't have to work 80 hours a week. We'll scan to it now in the yeah. podcast. <laughs> but um, like you're, you're moving here because you want the sun. You're moving here because you want the parks and you want the beach life. And, yeah. and you want the water close by and stuff like that. That's where everyone wants to live. And it's all within 10 or 20 minutes. Yeah. So it's not like crossing <clears throat> London and it takes you a couple of hours to cross in the tube. Yeah. Here, sure, even in rush hour, it's, it's never that bad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even if you live in the northern beach, I mean, I've spoken to so many people that live in the northern beaches that have never been to the eastern suburbs. So yeah. it's just one of those mentalities. Over and if here. you've got a boat, it's super quick. You yeah. just cross yeah. like that. If it you go by road, it's, Watson's it takes a bit, Manly, bit, bit longer. Yeah. yeah. Okay, guys, just going to interrupt this podcast. Just a quick one. If you are enjoying this podcast and you need either my services or Chris's services, please reach out and get in touch. All of our details will be in the description below. If you need a mortgage broker, if you're coming off a fixed rate, if you need to refinance soon, if you want to release some equity, you want to buy an investment property here in New South Wales or up the central coast, then please get in touch with Chris as well and we will get back on with the show. Thank you. So let, let's go on to, to, to um, you like the finer things in life. You were, at a boat, you were at a boat event yesterday, was it, or the day before? Yeah, yeah. 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 Looking yeah. at some boats. But, but a lot of these things then, it's, it, it's a lot more affordable than it can be. So the whole concept now, like the rent vesting, if you want to live in a $5 or $10 million home, it's more affordable to get in now through rent vesting Whereas a couple of decades ago, you'd have to have 10 million to go and buy something. Yeah. Like now, supercars, you can go and rent supercars. Uh, we were on a super yacht the other day for a function, so it was free. So I wasn't even on, like I didn't pay anything to go on there, yeah. but it was champagne and, and, and whatever else. So a lot of these things, by either buying, doing fractional ownership, i.e. you buy an eighth share of a boat mm -hmm. and, and share the costs, or you then go and rent the boat, or you then 
go and go to a networking thing. So one of the um, networking things I go to is called the Luxury Network. So they have all the big brands like Super Yachts and, yeah. and all the fashion houses and, and the jewelry. Yeah. And so I pay to go there because my client base is in those kind of places. Yeah. But by going to there, I've been on every super yacht in Sydney because they take them out and they show people. Yeah. And I've rented the super yachts as well. But again, they're, they're smoothing you and you get to enjoy all these things at the same time. So it's it's a bit of a bonus. Yeah, it's um, there's a lot. Of, it's like that saying, like once you have something after a few weeks, it normally the the, the, the shine comes the off. The shine comes off. Of well, it, like right? the view here. Yeah. So yeah, I've seen um, it a thousand times. Yeah, so. you're used to it, but it's not until someone else comes up and you say, yeah. "Hey, that's an amazing view," yeah. or "That's a nice car," or "That's a nice boat," that you suddenly realise, "Well, you've got to feel grateful for these things." Yeah, I think it is, it is definitely part of that. Like, rent. I think a lot more people are. Oh, well, it's like Timothy Ferris in the Four Hour Work Week. If you've read yeah. that book, right? Where he talks about. Um, you know, just why not just rent it for the day? Like yeah. you can go and get the Ferrari F three hundred and fifty five. I mean, I know you've got a big car collection, but yeah. yours are yours are classics, so they're, they're they're bound to go up in value. We'll get onto that in a bit. But um, if you want to go and drive a brand new Lambo, yeah, what, in, instead of buying it, you know, brand new off the forecourt and then losing all the X twenty percent immediately, and you know all that money that you're going to lose on it uh, over the next three or four years until it becomes a classic. Um, why not just rent it for the day? Yeah. Take it out, last year get I'd... a bit of fun out on you. And, and, you know, you can't park the bloody thing anywhere in Sydney anyway, and the hills are too <laughs> fucking... Well, last year we did um, <coughs> Ultimate Driving Tours, which was mm. over in, in Europe, and we spent maybe, I think it's 15 or 20 grand. So look, it's, sure, it's expensive, it's expensive but yeah. not compared to the depreciation. Yeah. We had eight cars racing around Italy. You try each car for an hour, then your, your partner or your co-driver then drives it for an hour. And at the end of the four or five days, you've had plenty of car time <clears throat> in probably four or five million dollars worth of cars, and you've had no liability, all the insurance is taken Give care of. They, you don't even have to turn the car around. You just drive in for the break, and then they clean the car and turn it around for you because they're trying to limit the damage. Yeah. So they don't, I mean, you can drive it at 100 miles an hour, yeah. but in the car park, you don't even have to turn it around. Well, the servicing on one of those vehicles is probably 10 grand. Yeah. So on my Lambo before, the worst, <clears throat> Um, bill I had was I think thirty thousand dollars for a clutch and some other major part. Fuck. So um, that's <laughs> that, that can be a scary bill if you haven't got the cash. You know they do one of those in Japan, one of those uh, luxury tour things. They take yeah. take all the old Japanese racing cars out and stuff like that. That looks like a that looks like a good tour to do, to yeah. do as well as the the Europe. But look, it, it can still be worth it because again I'm into second hand. So I bought this Lambo, so a 2005 Mercer Lago uh, Roadster. It was worth, say, 750 brand new. I bought it, I don't know, eight or nine years old. Um, so it's 2005. I paid 250, so I paid a third of the price. So someone dropped 500 grand on it. And then I sold it in the week of COVID. So I drove it for seven, year, seven years. I did about 50 or 60,000 Ks on it. So again, the more you use the car, the cost per kilometer is lower. Yep. And then I sold it for 290, $40,000 more than um, I paid for it. Which then counted some of the counted servicing the, bill. Counted the thirty grand <laughs> servicing bill. Let's go through it. Like, so have you always been a car guy? Always. Yeah. So from that courier doing mm. the courier at eighteen, I loved it. My dad taught me to drive in supermarket car parks that used to be shut on a Sunday in the yeah, UK. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I learned at fourteen, and now I love driving anything. So I've got my road train license, so I can drive fifty ton trucks that are literally the the main truck and then two trucks two behind. Two trucks behind it. I've yeah. done that in uh, in the um, western suburbs. I uh, bought myself a tank recently, uh, or an armoured car. How did you acquire a tank? Um, well, so everyone knows I've got a weird taste in cars. So there was one on Facebook marketing, so someone um, sent it across to me, and there was a four-ton ferret, and then there was an 11-ton Saracen tank that you could put about eight mates in the back as well. But um, I probably need arms like yours, because there's no power <laughs> steering to drive an 11-ton tank, or it's technically it's an armoured car. Um but then through, there's like a Facebook group for everything. So I joined the Ferret Facebook the tank, group. The, 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 the Australian tank yeah. group. And then I found one in Perth that was five grand cheaper. That, so the one in Western Sydney had been in a museum. It rusted and been sitting around, which isn't good for cars. Yeah. They need to be driven. All tanks. And this, this guy had um, completely rebuilt it 10 years ago. So it's immaculate. You could eat your dinner off the floor. Yeah. And um, yeah, literally just shipped it over. And so I'm trying to get it regoed. And drive it as a regular car to get pop down to Double Bay, go and get a coffee, pop into Woolies, get my weekly shopping. <laughs> you're so, going to be on that Double Bay Today Facebook page. You've seen yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And taking the piss out of everyone. But again, so even though I guess I've, I've got this lifestyle, 
a lot of people are surprised and reasonably down to earth. So my my favourite meal will be going for a pizza or a snitty down at um, the local pub and having a beer. So I'm sure I'm happy on a super yacht drinking champagne, but it's not my go to. I'm not yeah, into yeah, the yeah. five star restaurants. Yeah, we'll do it for work sometimes, but I'm a I'm a pub and a beer guy. Yeah. And no, going to the RSL and stuff like I'm that. I'm the same. I'm not interested in. I mean, it's okay to go to Hakkasan every now and then and do that type <laughs> of stuff. But actually, I'm I'm happier down the uh, local Indian with a couple of pints and then down the pub afterwards yeah, than I am. That's the British thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's nostalgic. Yeah. You know, you go into London. If you used to go out in London or anywhere in the UK in the cities and stuff, you go to. The, it's all pub culture. You know. Yeah. It's like. You know, you can go to the fancy bars and stuff like that, but half the time the doormen are wankers and you, yeah, yeah. You got, you, there's there's a dress code and you're not comfortable yeah. and you're like, oh, God, I don't know. Don't and that's, a, that's the thing in Australia because in the UK, and look, I, I, I worked in the West End, like in, in Soho and stuff, and everything's on your accent. And if you haven't got a public school boy accent, then yeah. they look down. And if you've got a northern accent, it's a, another different league. But here, everyone's reasonably kind of um, laid back and yeah. they don't worry too much. Also, there's a bit of Eastern Suburbs, North Shore thing. <laughs> <laughs> Have you crossed the bridge recently? Yeah. Um, so so let's let's go into this car collection then. Um, yeah. So basically in COVID, I was pretty pretty bored. Yeah. Um, the property market had done fairly well, so I had lots of equity. So I started buying um, cars kind of sight unseen. So I bought a, um, a 69 Ford Econoline van, which is like a big uh, American kind of uh, truck kind of thing. Yeah. And the guy had done up the outside but needed to fit out the inside. So then I was ordering custom beds from the UK that um, like a three-seater couch for the kids, but it then goes into a flat kind of bed almost bed, like yeah, business yeah, class. Yeah, yeah. So when we go camping with the kids now, rather than us pitch a tent with all our other friends that nice. spend the ages, we've literally got a doona in there. So it could be minus 10 degrees and we've got a big thick doona, our normal pillows, <laughs> super comfortable. And we put the two kids in pop-up tents and, and they can be outside. Yeah, yeah. And then I started getting into old Bentleys, old Rolls Royces. So rather than, so I went basically through Porsche, Ferrari and Lamborghini when I was younger into my 30s. Then I wasn't driving the Lambo that much because I'd had it for seven years. Mm. And so then I got into the British classics and stuff and some of the American hot rods. Yeah. And so just by researching through Facebook, I then started having cars built and I said, oh, I can bring this one over for 100 grand from the US. And then the builder would say, yeah, but it could be full of kind of rust and bog and all this stuff, I can rebuild you one brand new from from scratch and have it all engineered so it's all all legal and stuff. So I've started getting into that. So a lot of the cars might only be 40 or 50 grand, mm -hmm. but then I might spend 50 grand on them. And so to kind of, we've chopped the top off and lowered the roofs and, and things like that. And then we brand it with Your Empire. So they're all, um, they're all promotional cars yep. because they stand out so much and they get photographed. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So I just leave a car and and there's Your crowds around it straight away. Of it, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it was then a fun thing to enjoy. And I spend most of my time moving the cars and driving them. I've got NRMA memberships, like business memberships, because I'm breaking down all the time. <laughs> most NRMA guys around the country have done it. <laughs> but then I've got things like um, I do a thing called Mystery Box Rally or Ship Box Rally. Where so the, the, that comes from the the original shitbox rally was to Malaysia, right? From the, do you, do you not know too sure. Story? So no. there's a ten. <clears throat> the, there's a the, I think it's called the shitbox rally or something like that. And basically, you had to buy a car underneath two grand. Yeah, uh, under a grand, under, under yeah. a thousand pounds. Yeah, it had to be one point two liter. Obviously, right. you're on one point two liter. Yeah, but then you, you had to get it from London all the way to Malaysia. Right, it was ten thousand exactly, ten thousand miles. Okay, exactly. then, so that'll be fun. They do one in. So the Australian yeah. one, the shitbox rally, you can only spend a thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. Mystery box has got to be over twenty five years. So when I had the Lambo, I had two kids and only one spare seat. <laughs> So I thought rather than spend $1,000 on a shitty car, I want to do it in style. I want to do it, be a bit different, but also I need a four-seater car for um, taking the kids to school. Yeah. And so I bought a stretch Cadillac limousine, which everyone said there's no way you can take this in the outback. And I've spent a fortune. I've almost spent as much as the Lambo <laughs> on this, this Cadillac, but it's basically been lifted. Yeah. It's almost bulletproof, nine-inch diff. We put a brand-new small-block Chevy in there. It's got new wiring and the rest of it. <laughs> so I've done this rally. The first one, before I did all the amendments, we had the car on airbags, yeah. and the airbags blew. had a little stone in there on day two, and so the car collapsed. The second one, I was jumping off sand dunes at 100 k's an hour, and I snapped the axle because I had 100 kilos of um, fuel in the back. <laughs> the third time, we actually got through, and, and that worked. The fourth time I got COVID on the start line, 
So I, I did two days driving to get out there and then got COVID oh, that geez. tested. So this is then the fifth time and I name is Your Empire COVID free. And I'm taking my fire engine as a backup car. <laughs> so I actually pay for two teams. And then the whole idea is if my car breaks down, you then I'll go to the other guys and say, well, that's my car. And yeah, I'll, I'll pay for it. Well. So I'm, I'm driving that one. So when's that? When's the next So show? that's, I think, on the 12th of August. Is it that start in Coffs Harbour or something like that? In, um, uh, I think it's Bundina up in uh, Bundaberg. Bundaberg. That's so it'll be two days drive there. Yeah. Five days where we don't know where we're going. Yeah. And uh, two days back, so nine days. Who's going with you? But it'll, it'll be great fun. So a whole bunch of friends that um, that I've got now. So we've got maybe five five cars within our team, and then they give us two or three other kind of randoms. Mm. I think there's something like 125 cars going, so 250 people. We're all camping, so it's all kind of one-star living. Yep. The local communities come to then feed and drink us, so that gives money to the local communities. So we could be in a, like a three-person town. But all the local things that are struggling for business yeah, and yeah. stuff, they, you guys they turn up and we start. might spend <clears throat> fifty or a hundred grand there on food and drinks to yep. feed all that many people. So it's really good. So raise they've raised like I think thirty million for cancer council so far, and they put lots of money into the local community. So it's it's all good spirit. But you're out having fun. So talk, talking of fun, all that type of stuff. Like obviously this is that's that type of stuff's fun but it's also got a charity based thing behind it as yeah. well and it's advertising as well because i've obviously got my business got all over business the cars and stuff like that yeah. on there so the, all of this is funded by the portfolio right and and, and yeah. your empire the buyers agency yeah um, so it's basically there's no way that i could spend that amount of money on cars so i think i've spent something like a million dollars on cars and 700 grand doing them up so 1.7 million which is obviously a lot of money mm. but the next alternative, say from buying the Lambo, was to buy an Aventador, which is say one point whatever million, one, yeah. two, three million. So rather than have that one super expensive car that was depreciating, I thought I don't want to die only owning a couple of cars. Is rather than have those one super expensive, why mm. not have a whole portfolio of small ones? And the whole idea now is is I'll put them all up for sale, and then people can either swap cars with me or they can buy them if they want because they're all pretty unique. Yeah. And so I want to turn it over. So maybe in the next 10 years, I want to have 50 or 60 cars that I can try. So on my deathbed, I can say, hey, I didn't just have that Lambo for seven years. I've had a whole selection of, of different things. So obviously getting into the property market, building this portfolio out, how much is your portfolio worth now? So it's about 20, 25 million. And that's obviously been scaled over the last 15, 20 years, or whatever. Oh, so a lot of it was really from 20 to, I guess, about 35. I did virtually all my buying, so I haven't bought for a long time. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is, is say, say you get $10 million worth of property and say 10 million debt. So you're pretty highly geared. You just want to get to that 10 million. Because the, the old school is buy a house for a million and spend 25 years paying it off. Yeah. Mine was buy a whole bunch of them, <coughs> even if you're super highly geared. Then as 10 million doubles to 20 million, your debt still stays at that 10 or it creeps up maybe the... 11, 12, 13 million. Mm. But you go from 100% geared if it doubles to 50% 50 geared. geared yeah. And then that 20 then goes to 40. Mm. And even if you've got that debt, you're then only 20 or 30% geared. And even if you've leveraged yourself at that point, you could probably sell half the portfolio, pay the other half off and then carry exactly. on it or offset it, put it in the offset account to offset the... So again, the idea was, say my numbers <laughs> roughly a few years ago were say 20 million of property and 10 of debt. Mm. And I thought, what's the point of having all this equity and doing nothing? I may as well use it because even if it drops down a bit, it doesn't really matter. Because at five or 10% growth, it maybe makes one or $2 million a year. Mm. So after a while, you can't spend that kind of money. So sure, I'd love to live in a 50 or $100 million point piper house, but I know I'm not willing to put the effort and I don't want to take the risk of doing it. Yeah. So why not enjoy what you've created? Yeah. So if I go and put a couple of million dollars into cars and make the most of them, even if they're only worth a million later on, at least I've made the equity work for me and do something. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, this painting behind us was from a client. And so effectively, it was free. But I mean, that could be a million dollar painting. So if your passion was artwork, rather than have all your equity just sitting there doing nothing in the bank, why not use it to enjoy the equity to, <clears throat> to have something else, whether it goes up or down, yeah. doesn't really matter. I, I, I have this conversation with a lot of clients. So I, I, a lot of my clients, they'll obviously, Pommy's British. 
it's it's just the who keeps referring to me you know i yeah. just keep getting a load of pommies um <clears throat> easiest people to deal with actually because they just say you you say what you want them to do and they tend to do it but um i was having this conversation with a client a, a few clients actually uh, just last week and a couple of them said look i've got this inheritance money you know do i want to lower the the leverage mm. and i said you're 15 years away from retirement. You want to you want to put all the cash into the property. Yeah, I don't understand what your con- what the concept is here. You need you need to get out of your head that you need to pay it off. What I want you to do is actually borrow the maximum up yeah. to 80, percent and then I want to put that cash into the offset account so you've got access to it. Yeah, because you reach retirement age and you've got no income. Yeah, there's no way that the bank's going to release any of that equity because you don't have anything to leverage it off. Right. Yeah. So. And actually, <clears throat> doing the calculations on, you know, you're borrowing, you're buying a million dollar property, you borrow eight hundred grand, but you got an extra two hundred thousand. Leaving that in the offset account is actually more beneficial to you long term than it is actually putting it in the property and borrowing less. Yeah. Um, but until they see those numbers in front of them, and they realise shit, if the two hundred grand just sits in the offset account, I do nothing with it. Yeah. And I don't spend it. I don't need it or whatever. Uh, actually, I'm knocking off 10 years off my mortgage because it's offsetting the interest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, until until they see that, the the thing is still for, I reckon, a good 90% of people that we probably both of us talk to yeah. is that they want to pay it off. And, yeah. and, and to us, and it's old school. people, it's like it's, it's not what our parents it's not did 30 or 40 doing. years ago. Yeah. So pretty much everything I do in life is the complete opposite to what most normal people do. Mm. So rather than try and get the cheapest interest rate from the bank... I'm trying to go for maximum borrowing capacity because yeah. <clears throat> getting a cheaper interest rate can save you, sure, 10 or 20 grand. But if I buy another property, it makes another 50 or 100 grand difference to me. Yeah. And again, trying to maximize how many properties I can own. So doing all these things, this is why I got picked up by the media, say, 20 years ago and had my show on Sky and kind of 7, 9 and 10 is because I was saying something opposite. And because I was coming from an accounting background and from Deloitte's, people understood that I knew what I was talking about. Yeah. So I've had the debates with, on Sky with uh, economists and so with people at Deloitte's and all of these various people and, and the private banks and the rest of it. And it makes logical sense because it's basic numbers. But the emotions tell us to do something else. Yeah, Our do. parents tell us to do something else. The bank tells us to pay things off. But if you look at basic mathematics, it says, no, don't do that. Do the complete opposite. It's funny because my mum will still have this discussion with me and she's only got a mortgage of about 30000 which is about $50,000 left on her house. And she's like, oh, I just want to pay it off before I retire. I said, if, if you say that to me one more time, yeah. I'll kill you. <laughs> like, seriously. Because what the it. banks do, as soon as you pay the mortgage off, they write back to you and say, right, okay, you use your equity and borrow some more money. <laughs> so more money. what's the point waiting 25 years for it? And it's one of those, like, obviously, uh, offset accounts are talked about here in Australia a lot more than they are back home. Like everyone back home either makes overpayments mm. and they fix their mortgage for five years. And yeah. That's kind of, it's very basic. Yeah. Over here, you've got a lot more options. People talk about a lot of different things. These redraw accounts, offset accounts, all this type of stuff. And the wealthy people that we talk to on a weekly basis, they'll say, Ross, I want to borrow as much as possible. And then what I'm going to do a week after I've got that loan is I'm going to fill the offset account and I'm paying zero interest. Yeah. So they're effectively borrowing $2 million dollars as an example, obviously, like if you're a first time investor, it's going to be less, right? So let's say you're buying an apartment for 700 grand, you're borrowing 560, put your 20%, uh, 20% deposit down, stamp duty, all the rest of it, if you've got to pay your stamp duty. But you should be putting cash into that to offset its interest and mm. then you re leveraging that money to then buy and buy and buy and buy and buy. And, and, and the classic thing is, is, is like paying the mortgage insurance. So everyone mm. says, you go into the bank, no, save your 20% deposit mm. and put that down. But I'd rather, <laughs> if I had 20%, I'd rather buy two properties, put two, 10% yeah. into each because yeah. then I've got twice as much property. Mm. Or if it takes, it's going to take you a few years to save that 20% at least. Just Whereas if you've got five, 5%, you just could go buy it today. Five, yeah. Because the time it takes to save 50 grand, the property's probably gone up 100 or 200 grand. So it's, yeah. a, it's a false economy. Well, I say, I say as people that have only got a 5% deposit, I'm just like, I, I, I'm aware that you're going to pay a slightly higher interest rate. But in two years' time, once you've paid down that loan slightly, and once that house has gone up slightly, I can put you on the 80% loan. Yeah. We can switch you across. Oh, we might be able to release some equity, then you can buy another one. Um, so like recently, I've just got myself personally pre-approved for two properties, 10% deposit yeah. out of my. I mean, the properties that I'm buying are 500 grand each. Mm. So you're talking, I'm going to spend $100,000 
buying two properties, yep. whereas I could be just buying one. But I know that those two properties are both going to go up in value. Sure. And therefore, I'm, you know, if they go up by 7%, I mean, the economists are saying five, whatever. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, who cares? It's what the it's what you can get on the evaluation that matters. Yeah. Um, but buying those two and paying the lender's mortgage insurance is like seven grand on both of them. Yeah. Um, fuck, if I care about seven it's, grand. It's dollars like, and cents. Who gives a shit when, yeah. when your house is going up by 10% a year? But people think, <clears> oh, that's seven grand. That's going to take me a year to save that seven grand. But mm. it's not. Whether your mortgage is a million dollars or a million and seven, when those properties are worth two, four or six million, doesn't matter. It's, it's irrelevant. Cares, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if the house is going to double in price every 10 years, why, yeah. why did you care that you either paid 5% extra or 5% less because it went to auction or you got it off market or you, you yeah. paid the price privately or whatever it is? It, it, it's got zero relevance whatsoever in 10 years' time when it's doubled in price. Yeah. That's all. Because a lot of our strategy is to buy blue chips. So we're buying in the Bondi's, the Manly's, the Balmain type thing. Mm. And you're not going to get property cheap there. So you're paying good value for it. Mm -hmm. So you're paying a million. But at least if we avoid auction, we're not paying 5 or 10% over yep. the odds. We're not paying 1.1 because everyone's competing mm -hmm. because we've got it off market. But we don't mind buying that quality because in COVID or the credit crunch or the banking commission <clears> or whatever we're dealing with, those properties don't suddenly go down. Yeah. Whereas you buy some mediocre ones, you buy the cheap one and suddenly you can have problems. Let's just touch base on your business as a buyer's agency. So for a lot of people that have maybe moved over here from Europe or another country, buyer's agents aren't a common thing. Whereas sure. actually it's this it's, it's, it's quite a hyped up thing, I'd say, definitely around New South Wales for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's not common. I, I would say that most people don't understand it, why you would need it. Um, what are the benefits of going through a buyer's agent? I always find that anyone that I've ever given to you guys has been a, a very happy customer yeah. found it a simple transaction they can carry on with their normal week they don't have to worry about trying to go to open homes on the weekends and stuff like that what what are all the benefits of using the buyers agents sure so look when i started in 2004 then there was maybe 10 buyers agents in sydney now there's there's every tom dick and harry's one so <laughs> Everyone's a buyer's there's, agent. <laughs> there's obviously differences so the main thought was was when i was in that early 30s i thought i've got the knowledge and the relationships with the agents to buy property but with my own finances, I, I can only afford to buy one a year. So why wouldn't I do it to other people? So I had all these people wanting to be taught, and then the wealthy ones saying, I don't want to be taught, can you do it for me? Just do it, yeah. So that's when I started the buyer's agency. So the, the thought process is, is even if you've got the knowledge, so I've done my 10,000 hours to be an expert in property. First of all, have you got 10,000 hours part-time to then be that expert? But also it's then building the relationship with the agent, because if we buy... 25, 50 or 100 properties from an agent, we're going to build a relationship just like you do in any business. Yeah. And so if a stranger comes in to go and buy a property, sure, they can buy it. But will they buy it before it comes on the market for a better price when they don't even see it advertised? So part of it is having an expert like me to say, don't go for that shiny blue chip one that looks really cool because the strata fees are horrendous. It's on the wrong street. It's facing the right direction, the wrong direction. Whereas we'll buy this ugly duckling here that's in a better location. There isn't all the expensive strata. It's a much better investment and we can tart it up and we can paint it so it looks like brand new. Yeah, there's no gyms and swimming pools. Yeah. <clears throat> and so part of it is the strategy of buying the right thing, which most people don't see value in because they think they're the experts. Everyone thinks they're an expert at Everyone's property. Everyone's an expert, yeah. So quite often what they're doing is they see 30 or 50 people at auction pushing the price up from a million to 1.1 or 1.2. So if we can buy it pre-auction or even pre-market so no one's heard of it and we can pay, say, a million dollars on a conservative bank valuation, mm. then if we charge 2%, so say 20 grand per million, it's better than them paying 50 or 100 at auction. Yeah, because they're going to go and essentially possibly pay a million and 50, a million and one, a million and one five, whatever yeah. it was. Some of the stats I've seen recently in the news are crazy, you know. That's house, massive. House yeah. price, townhouse in... Newtown has gone from 1.2 million and then yeah. it sells for 1.7 million. And they're auction. celebrating oh, taking fucking... a picture behind the sign. I don't understand. As it. a, as a Ooh, suburb well record. Oh, fuck that. Yeah, you've, you've, you've just overpaid. overpaid. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously the mortgage brokers see it because then the bank tries to value it and say it's not worth that stupid amount of money. Yeah. But I guess the thing that then sets us apart from the other buyers agents is not only have we done it for 20 years and we're, we're one of the, the first few in Sydney, but even if you know how to buy property, 
how do you get to build that five, 10, 15, 20 million dollar portfolio? And how do you live off it? And how do you have the cars and the lifestyle from it as well? Mm. And so a lot of the education that I'm giving my clients is how to do it. So when you haven't got serviceability with the banks, how can you still then go and get a mortgage? Yeah. How can you live off your equity? How do you get the right accountants, mortgage brokers, all of those different types of people? So with these 101 buyers agents now, a lot of them might be 20 years old, they've never bought property in their life, but they're building a portfolio for someone else. Yeah. And they're learning how to use equity from people like me or from reading books. Whereas I'm saying, come to the source, because all the stuff, the latest stuff I've got isn't in my books. Yeah. It's all in my head. Yeah. And if you're one of my clients, you don't pay for strategy time, I'll tell you. I'll tell you how I do it. So the 1.7 I've just paid in cars, I've used property to, to get that. I've even told the banks that I'm buying cars and that there's no income stream and the rest of it, and the bank still lend me the money without proving a dollar of income. And obviously serviceability, as you know, it's, it's a hard thing to get past, mm. but if there's a will, there's a way. So yes, even without proving an income, I can still borrow millions of dollars to buy non-appreciating assets. So if I said I want to buy a house, that'll be even easier to, to get the money. Whereas on buying cars, that are vintage that you can't borrow money against. Yeah, it's um, it, it, there's always a bank that will lend the money. So it's like when when a when a customer comes to us and they're like, I, oh, you know, Ross, I, I don't have the serviceability that I need to get, or, or whatever it is, they're having issues, they've been declined by someone, they've got a, they've missed a payment on something, they've got a bad credit score, whatever it is. There's always a lender that's going to lend to you. Yeah, you're just going to pay a more premium interest rate for the first two years. But if you if you you're still making money, that. it doesn't matter. So the break even point on my properties is generally anywhere from one to three percent. Mm. So I think my properties go up at roughly say seven percent or seven to ten percent or doubling every seven or ten years. So as long as I'm making more than two or three percent, and I don't even count the um, the tax back because I assume I don't work and I'm not paying tax, so I don't get my tax back. Mm. Um, but as long as the properties go more than two or three percent, I make money over the long term. So. To me, that's a pretty safe bet. What do you think the biggest mistake is that people make when they're starting to look into property? Is it the emotional side of things? Do you think people... I think the biggest thing is most people don't do it. Uh, most people come up with 101 excuses of it's not the right time or I'm waiting for my bonus or the market's too high or the market's too cheap or interest rates are too expensive. Hmm. There's always an excuse. You're never going to find the perfect storm. Hmm. And then I guess the second thing of the ones that do take action is most of the, t the time they're, they're dollar and diming it is they're worrying about what things cost. So they'll go to the cheapest accountant, the cheapest mortgage broker, the cheapest loan, and they'll miss out on the big picture. So again, is getting the biggest property with the biggest discount. Normally, if it's got a massive discount, it's because no one wants it. Mm. I'd rather pay full price for a property that ticks all the boxes than something that doesn't, and that's why it's cheap, because no one wants it. Yeah. So if you want a big deal now, go and find a block of units with 500 brand new properties in there, that they were selling to foreigners who aren't buying now, and you can get 20 or 30% off. But why would you want to buy a property that's 20 or 30% off? Because as soon as the shit hits the fan, your property is going to go down in value. The bank's going to come knocking and saying, you need to tip money into your mortgage. Yeah, you can't leverage anymore. Yeah. Because your property is worth less than it was when you bought it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, the house that I've just moved into was uh, purchased for 3.9 million. It's worth about 3.9 five five now yeah those and that's guys, the they, bought, they bought too high they got yeah. they got um emotionally invested into it and 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 that's the that's the problem i always, I always say to I always say to people when they contact us i say <clears throat> regardless of whether you're going to use these people you should talk to them mm. so you've spoken to me you've gone direct to your bank your bank's going to sell you those products you come to me i don't charge anything uh, it's in your best interest. Like I'm, I'm probably going to find you a better deal than you going direct to CBA, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's the odd occasion where you can't, but that's like. But even so, you. but they go and move for for fifty dollars or a few hundred bucks or even a few thousand dollars a year. Yeah. But what they don't realise is the education that a good mortgage broker can give them mm, to mm. then push them on to get their second property quicker. Yeah. That then makes tens of thousands of dollars difference. Because we've got their strategy in mind, right? So someone comes to us and they say, I want to build a portfolio. Well, I'm going to check the equity position every six months. I'm going to check the rates once a year. The mm. bank's not going to do that for you. They yeah. want you to stay put. They want you to shut up and they want you to increase, yeah. in, increase, increase the interest rate every single year, right? So you come to a good mortgage broker. You talk to the right buyer's agent. Um, and accountant, so how you can strategize it. You know, if you've built a bigger portfolio, how do we manage your money now? Because we need to maybe put these into trust funds and stuff like that. So instead of you having to worry about all that stuff, 
Yeah. Why not just employ the people that you need yeah. to do the job, right? And they're going to push you. Because a big complaint, that, or not complaint, a comment that a lot of people say is, oh, I wish I'd read your book 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Mm. Or I wish I'd met you then. Mm. And it's, well, put it into action now then. Yeah. And so I pay a lot of money to my accountant. I don't know what the hourly rate is, but I don't care because I know my accountants make me money rather than effectively cost me money. Mm. Sure, they cost me money, but the education, the knowledge. So where I'm trying to push the limits or I'm worried because interest rates have just suddenly gone up 4 or 5% on 10 or $15 worth of debt, when my accountant looks at my numbers and independently says, no, Chris, I think you're in a secure position and you should be sleeping well at night, mm. it gives me the confidence that I haven't missed some major thing and I'm being stupid. And this is why I like people to leverage more than they sometimes want to. And it's because if they've got that saving sitting in the offset account or they've got it available in a high saving account somewhere else or whatever it is, if the interest rates do go up and they're negatively geared for, uh, to an extortionate amount or they lose their job or there's, some, there's always a cash buffer. Yeah. So I've heard you before talking about cash buffers. Uh, all of your houses buffered slightly? Yeah. So, I mean, effectively, it's all a big pool now. And so yeah. I just have it over, yeah. over some of the accounts. But the whole idea is, is even when I was younger, is say a property, a million dollar property might cost you 10 grand a year to to cash flow. Mm. So if people are on low incomes or say 50 or 100 grand, they might say, I don't want to buy more property because each property cost me 10 grand a year to cash flow. Yeah. I've got no money for going out. So the whole idea from day one was to use the equity to then cash flow those properties. Cash flow, yeah. So when I'm buying a million dollar property, I'll then need to find the deposits at 20%. So say 200 grand plus 50 grand for stamp duty. But I might then pull out another 50 grand, which is then my cash buffer. So I'm effectively borrowing 1.1 million against a million dollar property by using equity from another. Yep. But I know I've got five years cash flow. So buying that property, I don't have to take a dollar from my own pocket for the next five years. And in five years time, that house is You gone refinance, yeah. you've re ideally you refinance every year, you <clears> keep pulling it out. And the rent will probably go up. And, and then you use that as deposits on other properties. So the whole idea is, is in every single one of my, I guess, um, property accounts or mortgages, I've then got enough money that's looking after me for a year or two at least to then cash flow it so I'm not taking it from my wages effectively. Okay, let's um, let's just give a little bit of a recap. Top three things that you want people to do when they're talking about property. So the main thing is, is get rid of the emotions, concentrate on the numbers and not listening to your friends and family in the media. Yeah. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is you've just Buy got a <laughs> yeah. well, it's good for savings then you've <laughs> yeah. got to do something to go yeah. and do it yeah. the second thing is is just go and take some action you're never going to get 100% knowledge I've done this for what's it 30 years I've had 10 years on Sky News interviewing all the different experts I don't I still don't know everything and you never will so it doesn't matter mistakes in property generally as long as you hold on long enough the mistake works itself out and then the next thing is is invest in the best advisors you can now, obviously, things like mortgage brokers you don't need to pay for, and it's just the same as whether you go to the bank direct as if you go through you, so take the knowledge. But all the other advisors is invest in it. So these days, you've got to spend money to make money versus the parents' generation was like, look after a, look after the pennies, the pennies look after the pounds. Yeah. So I spend tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars on my education to get better experts that then take me to another level. And that's why effectively passively I'm earning one or two million dollars a year because I've invested in other people. Yeah, you don't need to be the smartest it, person in the room. And, everything but also is I'm not that busy. So everyone says, oh, you run a business, you're on Sky News. Like I travel 15 times overseas. Um, so I do a lot of traveling, I've got young kids, but I've actually got lots of free time because I delegate everything out and I get experts to do it for me. So delegation, procrastination. Yeah. <laughs> And getting, getting experts Again, it's all, the, it's, it's all the classic things. So yeah. it's not brain surgery. Sure, it is super simple, but it's too simple for most clever people. So if you're too clever, I agree, yeah. it's going to be hard for you. If you're not that clever, it should be pretty much straightforward. It should be pretty straightforward. Yeah. Put your money here. Just get on with this, it. Just get on with it. It's yeah. procrastinating. And again, buy the best property you can in the best location because we've all heard location, location, location all around the world, and it's there for a reason. Mm. You buy good quality locations that's a scarce resource someone will pay to rent it or to buy it. 100%. Even if they're students, whoever, doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, doesn't matter. Anyone. Yeah. Cool. Okay, last thing. One thing you miss about the UK, one thing you love about Australia. 
Do you miss anything uh, about the, the UK? The UK is the hard, <laughs> the hard one, I reckon. Look, a good English pub on a summer's day and kind of um, a sausage sandwich and a pint, yeah. then that was always good. But there, there wasn't go. that many at that's those it. times and, and the rest of it. Um, that's hard. But look, Australia, again, we'll do some kind of uh, shots of outside in the cars. I just love driving my cars in the beautiful sunshine. We're in the middle of winter. We're in the middle of winter. Perfect temperature. Unbelievable. It's, it's just good lifestyle. Helicopters flying past, the, the boats yeah. are out, everyone's having a good time. So again, even but... lockdown in COVID, so we had four of us in this apartment, it's only a couple of hundred square metres or so. But again, looking at the view, the nearest neighbour is like North Sydney, which is like K's and K's away. You don't feel enclosed because you've got all this fresh air, yeah. you've got blue skies and, and all the space. So come to Australia. Good place. <laughs> Cheers, guys. We're going to wrap it up there. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and comment who you would like on next. Thank you very much.